We have a stellar panel today, and I'm not supposed to give their detailed bios, but they're all uh, in the program that you can look at if you haven't already. Um, uh, interestingly, each of our panelists uh, has recently been a senior official of the Justice Department in one position or another. Uh, and also, interestingly, two of them are now in private practice at firms, and the other two are in-house, so it's a good mix. Um, briefly, in alphabetical order, we have Christina Duggar who is Assistant General Counsel at JPM Chase, where she is Head of Government Investigation and the Regulatory Enforcement Group. Uh, formerly, more, more, most recently in government, she was the Chief Assistant U.S. Attorney uh, in the Eastern District under uh, someone named Loretta Lynch. Uh, we have Dave O'Neill, who's a partner at Debevoise and was formerly the Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at the Justice Department <coughs> in Washington, uh, as well as having other positions. Uh, Tom Pirelli, who was a partner at Jenner Block and formerly the Associate Attorney General for the United States. And finally, Steve Reich, who is the General Counsel of the Americas for Deutsche Bank and a former Associate Deputy Attorney General at DOJ. So an impressive roster indeed. Uh, we're budgeted now for 40 minutes. I promise to save a few minutes at the end for questions, so keep that in mind if you have them as we go along. Uh, just to get things started, you've seen the title of our program. Um, obviously, big corporate investigations are, uh, are not new, as we've seen over the last 20 plus years or so. There have been plenty of uh, examples over that time of uh, big corporate problems and, and resolutions, et cetera. However, I think the premise here is that the current era that we've seen in the last few years of what I refer to as transnational cases involving multiple agencies across various countries uh, sometimes with years of fact-finding around the globe, really seems to have become uh, the norm, at least uh, to some degree, in our business, uh, and especially if you are reading the, the business press these days. Um, and it's not just limited to FCPA cases, as we've recently seen in the FX and LIBOR matters and in the spate of OFAC sanctions investigations of big banks in the last <clears throat> eight or ten years or so. Uh, these types of cases have become big business for the government, I'd submit, and a huge profit center for big law, which is, I think, uh, part of the premise here, but indisputable, as well as a huge cost center for uh, uh, much of corporate America. So let's start with some obvious and perhaps basic questions. Uh, Tom, um, how and why, in your view, has this trend line evolved in this way? Uh, meaning, what are the economic and sort of policy drivers that have led us to the situation where we've got so many of these mega cases being investigated by multiple agencies around the globe? Well, I mean, I think uh, you know the United States exports a lot of things, and anti-corruption investigations has turned out to be one of them. And I think that you see uh, in you know, for many years, there were a few areas where there were established sort of norms and cross-border uh, work uh, done by investigating agencies, but not many. And now I think you see a combination of uh, both some measure of regulatory cooperation, but a lot more sort of almost regulatory competition. Uh, that if you are, as companies become more global, uh, the idea of it's only the U.S. authority investigating a company that may have done, done something in your backyard, the idea that you would leave it to the United States to deal with it only, uh, really has, I think, created an environment where uh, other investigating authorities want to be involved, even if it's at the tail end. Uh, and, and as uh, sophistication and those practices develop, I think this is a trend line that's not going away. And let me just ask randomly, um, uh, Steve, I mean, picking up on that, uh, I mean, there was a time when, especially in the earlier sort of uh, FCPA era, if you will, when most of the big cases were FCPA investigations, at least internationally, there was a time when uh, the, the U.S. government in some circles was criticized for really disadvantaging uh, its own, the U.S. Uh, listed companies compared to some of the foreign companies. And there was a, a time when, uh, you know, the DOJ in particular, perhaps the SEC was criticized in some circles for trying to be the world's policeman. And now, um, you know, as, as Tom has just mentioned, we, we see an era where there seems to be other countries picking up on that, emulating the U.S. enforcement profile and mechanism, trying to get perhaps in competition with the U.S., their own headlines, et cetera. Um, let me ask you, put it this way, is, is that something that is in the U.S. interest and from the U.S. government's perspective, is that something that they're trying to uh, promulgate and promote worldwide? Well, look, I mean, you know, uh, U.S. enforcement authorities have been sort of the most aggressive, I think, globally, uh, and typically are the first out of the box. But I, I think p 
put in the fairest light to regulators around the globe, particularly in the industry that I work in, the financial services industry, regulators are looking at some of the conduct that's occurring globally, uh, and they're saying we have a significant equity, particularly where we're the home country regulator, in making sure that, um, that questionable conduct gets addressed by them so that the, the perception around the globe is not that they can't uh, police their own institutions and that they have to leave it to the United States. But certainly I think the United States model has shown um, both that it's effective and profitable and that's, that's a clear lesson that other regulators have drawn from what's happened here. Let me just push that a little further and, and turn to Dave, who I know is involved in some of these re more recent resolutions. Um, I, my understanding is that in some of these cases, the U.S. government has actually been um, sort of pushing foreign agencies to take the lead in some of the settlements and get the kind of headlines that the U.S. used to be exclusively the, uh, uh, in, in their province, um, really perhaps to uh, you know, not only you know, uh, develop further the notion that we're not the only you know, world cop on the beat, um, but to uh, perhaps deflect some of the criticism that the U.S. has been overreaching some of these areas. Is that, is, is there something to that? Is that a real phenomenon, and do you expect that to continue? I think there is. I mean, that is certainly what the Department of Justice has been saying. Um, if you look at the stated reasons for the Department's very aggressive approach to anti-corruption around the world, one of the goals is to uh, hope that other countries emulate those, uh, those enforcement uh, mechanisms and to develop their own uh, enforcement muscle and the department has said that when that happens it will step back and allow those countries to take the lead. I think it will be very interesting to see whether the, the United States in fact does that. Um, right now some of the most, uh, some of the largest anti-corruption investigations around the world right now are ones in which the United States is taking a back seat. That presents you know an interesting and somewhat novel role I think for some US law firms and white collar lawyers who you know, also are in the position not of, you know, doing the front lines of the investigation, but, but being there in case it develops into a U.S. Uh, investigation. Okay. Um, Christina, just turning back to the sort of the business impact of this on uh, the litigation industry, if you will, um, and just testing the hypothesis about this for a little bit. Uh, we have in the last 20 years, you know, seen perhaps episodically uh, uh, eras of big corporate investigations following uh, economic downturns or other other events like the dot-com bust and uh, uh, the accounting scandals of uh, 10 or 15 years ago or so. Uh, do you think perhaps that what we're seeing right now in terms of all these headlines that we're again in a bit of an investigations bubble or is this really uh, something we should view as a more permanent feature of our um, sort of litigation industry? I mean, I think it, it is a bit of a bubble in the sense that we're at the top of, you know, the cycle maybe um, following the, the financial crisis of uh, 2007, 2008. But um, I, I think even if you look historically, um, even as the cycles, you know, ebb and flow, you, you, you've just had an uptick in general over the course of that period of regulatory and government scrutiny over corporate America. And so... I actually think it's a bubble, but I think we're almost, you know, the, but the most likely outcome is that we're going to plateau at this number for a while and then maybe spike again, maybe come back down to, uh, to level set. Um, but I, I kind of know just from my own, uh, you know, review of statistics uh, at my firm and while I was in the government, I don't know that um, the number of cases really decreases as the cycle goes down. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's a I have no crystal ball, but that would be my, my prediction. Like I say, it's big business for the government. Yeah. And, um, it, well, but let me ask this. If, if it's true that this trend line will continue, and I think it's obvious that, as everyone says and tells us, that you know, globalization really propels these kinds of investigations because it, it, it you know, sort of starts you know, examining you know, multinational company conduct in all these far-flung places. Um, and I'll put this to the entire group and see who comes up with which ideas first. But as clients always ask us, you know, they want us to look around corners, looking ahead to the extent you have, even without a crystal ball, what are the types of uh, new subject matter areas that you can imagine that kind, kind of trend line and globalization leading us to in terms of the investigations in the future, the ten, five or 10 years down the road? Do you have any ideas? Anybody? I mean, I think money laundering broadly construed, if you look at the Bank Secrecy Act cases and the set of issues those raised and then looking at 
well, how those are, could play out more broadly. I think you may also find that there are going to be other countries that will have different views about what money laundering might be even than U.S. law, and it might be even uh, a more challenging environment in some, in some of those countries. I think the cyber, uh, the cyber threat will be kind of, it's already obviously something that we all talk about and think about, um, both in the government and uh, in corporate America, but I think as you know, we continue to be, to have you know, more uh, public attacks on everything from uh, you know, my own personal information being stolen, maybe you guys too, yeah. um, with the ha <laughs> recent hack of the Office of uh, Personnel Management. Don't do business with big banks, right? Well, this is, uh, this is the government. This is the government. This is uh, OPM, which uh, recently uh, was, uh, I mean, attacked, uh, and I don't know how many millions of federal employees' personal information was stolen. So, um, you know, between that and the hacks on corporate America that ha that are attempted every day, I think eventually, with all the kind of disparate approaches that corporations bring to it, and all the you know different resources that are already being brought to bear um, by law enforcement. I think at some point the rubber's going to hit the road, and um, corporations are going to be, you know, found to be in the crosshairs for not having done a good enough job um, on that front. Dave? So we didn't we didn't collaborate on this in advance, but I would have said the exact two uh, that uh, that the others have highlighted. I think AML um, is just uh, you know is it, is becoming in some ways as large as the FCPA has been in terms of the number of investigations that we're seeing in our practice. Um, and cyber, I, I agree, I think cyber is going to be uh, very interesting to see how it develops. I think companies that we are talking to more and more are putting it under the compliance umbrella so that it's anti-corruption, sanctions, uh, AML, antitrust, and cyber are really the pillars of the compliance uh, function. I, I just add one more thing which is in addition to these sort of newer theories of wrongdoing, um, the, the changes in technology and the way that we do business as a, as a firm um, create new opportunities for people to engage in more traditional kinds of wrongdoing, things like market manipulation, which has been around forever, but, but the technology, the way we actually execute our business on a day in, day out biz, uh, basis, you know, really changes sort of how that gets accomplished. And frankly, if we could figure out what, what the implications of the new technology were for that, we, we try our best, and we do try our best to get ahead of it from a compliance perspective. But it's very, very difficult to figure out sort of what all the implications of the new technology are. Just sticking for a moment on the prognostication point, putting aside the subject matters uh, of the future, um, there's a lot of focus within our pra practice, at least, of you know where the in what countries and regions the the work you know will be coming from or is coming from and the state of play and the degree of uh, aggression if you will in the enforcement uh, arena in different places around the globe um, what do you guys see maybe Tom I'll get back to you in terms of uh, you know it is you know is it the UK that really will be uh, the, the, the second in line or maybe first in line soon enough with the US in terms of being global policemen uh, what about Asia what other countries should we look to as emerging uh, either um, uh, sort of colleagues or threats depending on how you view this kind of activity well I mean there's no question that the UK is is developing you know the uh, the anti-corruption efforts, you know, following the the U.S. lead, but in a similar way. But but I, I do think that uh, I, I'm not sure I could tell you which country in Asia is going to end up being, you know, in in the forefront here. But I think that there's a lot of activity and interest. Uh, what what that tangibly comes out to be in five years in terms of their the kinds of investigations that they do, uh, uh, hard to hard to predict. Uh, you know, we can all, all of us talk, you know, I'm sure do plenty of talks about countries that you worry about from an anti-corruption perspective, but in terms of who's actually going to, which country's actually going to be investigating those, those types of things seriously in five years, harder to predict. Anybody else on that point? The question of which countries are likely to be more credible than not in the coming years in terms of their investigative or the, and, and enforcement punch. I think, you know, it's hard to tell from the, the outside sometimes how much of that is, you know, press release versus, you know, actual uh, talent and ability and threat from the enforcement point of view. I, I guess I'd just add to what Tom said. I mean, I, I agree. I don't know 
which ones, but what I can tell you um, is fairly remarkable is when we have an issue arise in one country, uh, the conversation in, internally and with our outside counsel is not just around whatever country it arose in and the United States. We literally span the globe through our legal department uh, and with our outside counsel, meaning that the sheer number of regulators around the globe who have interest in these matters is just, it, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, with that backdrop, turn to some of the more practice and, and sort of uh, profession focus questions. Uh, the description of our panel uh, includes reference to the notion that this whole practice of involving these, these giant international investigations has become a, quote, cash cow for law firms. Um, Dave, you just left the government within the last year. Um, I'm sure you spoke to a variety of firms. Do you think of yourself as a cash cow? <laughs> uh, well, I'm only six months in, so not yet. Um, cash calf, maybe. Cash calf, exactly. <laughs> you know, I think... Um, uh, those of us in the, in the white collar bar chafe at that um, because I think there is something of an unfair um, reputation that white collar lawyers, internal investigations lawyers, you know, they, when, when the company is staring down the barrel of the gun from the government, all of a sudden the lawyers come along and, and you know, take advantage of the company and try to sell them on a massive worldwide investigation where you have to turn over every stone and the company is in a, really not in a position to, to push back on it. Um, I think there are firms that unfortunately do take advantage of companies in that way, um, but I think you know, it's really it's not necessary, and I think actually if you look at some of the statements from my former colleagues at the Justice Department, they have been very careful to say, if you see an isolated problem, we don't expect you to boil the ocean and try to find every uh, every instance around the world where a similar problem might have arisen. And so I think one of the best values that a lawyer can give a company that is facing a compliance issue is to be able to tell it, you know, stop here. You really don't need to uh, examine everything. You don't need to do an overhaul of your compliance program. Um, and for those of us who try to give that advice, I think the, the cash cow reputation is, uh, um, is one that we don't relish. Mm. I mean, uh, Christina and Steve, from the client point of view, uh, what do you think about this issue, the notion that there's been, in some quarters, at least teeth gnashing at the scope and cost of some of these investigations uh, in a context where it's maybe difficult to uh, you know, predict where uh, one of these investigations is going to lead, hard to perhaps rein in uh, the scope of an investigation once it's opened up and uh, where the company is, after all, uh, pledging in most cases to co cooperate with the government and turn over all the facts. Would, would you, is there a problem here? And, and, and if so, how do you think it ought to be addressed? That's a lot of questions. That's a multiple question. <laughs> gotcha. um, <laughs> look, I mean, as far as the law firms go, I mean, we need the law firms, right? I mean, it's a partner, it's a true partnership. Um, so I don't ever look at somebody like, like Dave and say he's a cash cow. I, I think that I view the partners uh, at the law firms that we deal with and their associates as true members of the team and we're trying to get our arms around the problem. And um, I think um, at JP Morgan anyway, we, we have a very sophisticated in-house uh, legal team. Uh, most of us have either been in the government or with a regulator um, on my team or have handled our own matters. So, you know, we're not kind of these neophytes who have to just listen to advice from outside counsel, we have our own views and that's why many law firms hate us, um, right? Um, we're very involved, we're very engaged, we're questioning, we're adding our own two cents in. Um, and, but I guess you have to be mindful um, as an in-house lawyer that while we are partners, you know, there is this tension in the sense that you know, our interests aren't perfectly aligned, right? If the matter went on forever and grew to be a behemoth, it would actually only benefit the law firm. It wouldn't, I wouldn't get a raise and uh, it would impact our shareholders. And so we try to be very mindful of that and be collaborative and think of the right strategy to, um, you know, appease the, the government who expects, you know, full cooperation with a, you know, with gold stars and a, and a bow on it. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you have the right conversation with your, your government counterparts or your regulatory counterparts, usually you can find some reason there and some reasonable approach. Um, there are the outliers that don't want to necessarily hear you out, but usually if you can escalate appropriately within that agency, um, 
you know, we've had some success in that area, so. so these are two, two things occur to me about this. The first is Christine is absolutely right. I mean, shame on me and shame on the lawyers who work for me if we don't manage our outside counsel appropriately. I mean, our, our job is not to just um, sit there and let them decide on their own what the scope of the work should be. It's part of our job to partner with them, as Christina said, but also to manage them. And the second thing is, while I agree with Dave that the head of the criminal division here in the US, uh, Leslie Caldwell, has recently said publicly that the Department of Justice here doesn't expect um, uh, subjects of an investigation to boil the ocean. The reality is that not every regulator around the world um, shares the same view. And I think one of the tricky things that, that we're faced with um, you know, as a, as a global financial institution is trying to reconcile the varying scope of matters that regulators in different parts of the globe have. So, while the U.S. may not want the ocean boiled, there may well be regulators elsewhere who do. Yeah. It seems to me that running through your answers is uh, impliedly the notion that there's got to be some level of trust, obviously, at, among both the, the, the client, the law firm, and the government uh, involved, uh, just so that everyone uh, you know, knows that what's, what they're doing is uh, you know, in the client's interest and, 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 and what the government wants at the same time. They may not be perfectly coincident uh, goals, but. Um, uh, Tom, do you want to comment on that? I mean, Dave's notion that you know the government you know will give you guidance as necessary if you if there's things you don't need to do. I haven't heard that a whole lot over the years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people always ask me, well, the, does the government actually give you credit for uh, you know the kind of due diligence that they a a ask companies to do? And I think they actually do give you credit. But uh, you know, one of the things that I certainly see is companies that have a broad-based approach and maybe spend more money than they need rather than taking the time at the front to plan and invest and think about risk. You know, the sort of paradigm example, and I know a specific example like this, where you have, uh, you're thinking about, you're, you give the same uniform type of training to everybody across the world because you want to cover your bases on FCPA, but the reality is you only have sort of one or two countries where you might really have a problem because of the level of your sales, your activities there, whatever. And it's a mistake not to divert more resources to focus on those. And I think at, you know, in conjunction with outside counsel, companies really need to work on that risk-based approach. Uh, I think many companies do a great job of it, but, but I see a lot of folks who, uh, who ask themselves the question, uh, boy, if I, if I conclude that I have more risk there, what's going to happen when the government shows up and asks me questions? That's going to suggest to them that uh, maybe I knew I had a problem all along. Yeah, I mean, to what extent do you find that part of the problem here is that, you know, when you start launching one of these investigations, obviously there's some focus at the outset, but as things spool out in, you know, different countries and different business lines, et cetera, there comes a point, correct me if I'm wrong, when it almost feels like you're trying to prove the negative to the government. And that sort of raises this open-ended question. And, and that presents, I suppose, the possibility that you, know, you could just go on for, forever writing on a blank check as well, right? Yeah. Um, let, let me turn to a different topic. Uh, again, however, sort of practice and law firm and client strategy related. And that is, um, and I think some of the panels earlier touched a little bit on this, this question. Um, you know, now that we see that it's not just uh, America as the top and only cop, uh, you know, running these investigations around the world, but that you now have credible and aggressive enforcement uh, agencies in different uh, ju jurisdictions, I wouldn't call them local jurisdictions, they are sovereign, uh, independent jurisdictions, um, it raises the question, obviously, of what resources um, either the law firm and or the client needs in those locations, in country, um, and whether there needs to be uh, both local law, as I'll call it, ex expertise uh, to both uh, understand the, the local laws uh, and regulations, but also to interface as necessary with the regulators and prosecutors in those other countries. Um, starting first from the law firm perspective, so let me address it to uh, Tom and Dave. Um, obviously, and we've heard a bit about this today as well, I think including in, uh, the, our last speaker from DLA, uh, the law firms these days you know, have really uh, covered the map in terms of the strategies adopted and the bets being made about how best to uh, adopt an approach that will be attractive to clients in this regard. And they range from the global behemoths, which you've heard about, with, you know, who, who offer one-stop shopping and sort of boots on the ground in every location for any client who has a multi-jurisdictional problem 
to on the other end of the spectrum, you know, law firms that uh, you know in the U.S. that have largely adopted a, what could be identified as sort of a mono line or or sort of single office or single office with a couple satellites approach, uh, and who uh, advertise their ability to work you know locally with the best of the best in each jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just focusing on that strategic dichotomy at this point, focus on the phenomenon of big investigations in different jurisdictions. Um, what do you guys think of that dilemma and how have your firms respectively addressed that issue? I mean, I, and I'll, I'll start and Dave, you can jump in. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I do come from a firm that has really made a bet on that side, which is we really bet that uh, what clients want are a top flight uh, legal talent who can work with the best of the best in countries across the globe. Uh, so we have elected, and this was a very conscious strategic decision not to be everywhere. Uh, and uh, and I think part of that is uh, what we heard from our clients maybe a decade ago uh, was that, uh, well, well, why don't you have somebody in X country or Y country? We're going to have to go to another firm for this big investigation. And over time, and, and we really did perceive, I think, that we were, we might have to shift our strategy. And over time, what we heard from our clients was, you know, I tried that. And sometimes it works, but actually what I'm looking for is a lawyer that I trust to manage a very large process um, because whether they're all in the same firm, they're in a virtual law firm, or they're a bunch of law firms working together, uh, the folks I want to run the investigation, I, I need to have confidence in and trust. And that's not the same thing as being everywhere. And so for us, you know, I, I feel like there's been a swing back in some ways uh, from our clients <coughs> and has really, you know, from our perspective, uh, been an important part of our strategy. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that uh, for clients who are facing uh, a global problem, one that touches many, many different jurisdictions. It can be very attractive uh, to look at a law firm that has, you know, three offices on Mongolia and can handle, you know, any, uh, any jurisdiction you need and it will all have the same name on it. Um, you know, the, like uh, Tom's firm, ours has not taken that approach and, and the view that we take is that um, all that a global behemoth has done is in advance has gone and con contracted with a whole lot of firms in a lot of different countries. Um, we would do the same thing. The difference is that we have the flexibility on a new matter to find the right firm in that jurisdiction for the matter. So we have a little bit more flexibility about who we work with in any particular situation. I do think that, you know, going back to your question about the areas that are going to be particularly active, I think it is um, important to have some presence um, in this space in four areas. I think Asia is very important. I think UK is important. Uh, New York and DC. I think those are, you know, you, it's very important to have those four jurisdictions covered and to have at least some base of operations and some people with some expertise in each of the, those jurisdictions just because any matter is likely to touch on them. Steve and Christina, let me put the same question to you, focusing still on the question of choice of outside counsel as opposed to strategy for inside departments, which I'll come to in, in a second. We don't have a, a behemoth representative on the, on the panel, it seems. Um, if one were here, I'm sure an argument would be made that it's not just contracting with local lawyers around the globe, but there are, there are synergies, there are uh, quality issues, there are uh, communications and trust issues in the different jurisdictions. What's your perspective as in-house lawyers supervising and, and overseeing these kinds of investigations with respect to what is your preferred route in terms of choosing outside law firms? So uh, I'll start. I mean, for me, generally speaking, I agree with what Tom and Dave have said. The, the really important thing for me is who am I relying on, not whether they're in a single firm or in multiple firms. I'll just identify one area where I think there is some value to having sort of a mega firm that has offices in multiple places. And that's when you have a matter that touches a lot of different jurisdictions. One of the most intractable problems that we deal with on a day in, day out basis are the various data privacy um, laws and restrictions that exist in, I think now, almost every country around the globe. And so one of the things that I may be looking to a mega firm to do, if I don't think they have the right expertise in every part of what I need, is the ability to have people around the globe who already are connected 
to a, to a data system who have the ability to review documents because mostly what these data privacy restrictions do in each of the countries is say you can't take data out. So normally what we would want to do in a case uh, is we would want to take data and export it to a jurisdiction where we could staff the review of the data at a much lower rate. The data privacy restrictions that exist in countries around the world I mean we can't take the data out. We've got to do it in the country where the documents exist. And for that, I actually do think there's some value in having one firm do the review. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I would echo, echo what, what these guys said. Um, you know, when we are looking uh, to which to, we have a new matter and we're trying to figure out how to staff it and who to bring in to help us on it, you know, I think we're looking first and foremost for subject matter experts, uh, lawyers uh, who have the, the relevant experience in the relevant jurisdiction, what we perceive to be the, the jurisdiction. I mean, the, the real... Um, the real thing is that we don't sometimes know how many other jurisdictions are going to join the party. So it's hard to predict. It's hard to pick the law firm that's got the, you know, every place that we need them to be. Um, and so we do rely on, um, you know, having that leader, that that lawyer we trust, the person we think has the requisite experience, um, to to bring in other law firms. It's not ideal. Um, there you do lose synergies, um, and. It's hard to keep a handle, I think, on expenses, or it's more challenging, I should say. Um, but you know, that's just the way it works. I would agree that those key jurisdictions that, that Dave pointed out are, are important to me in many cases, because um, I not only have to feel comfortable about hiring Tom, I have to, you know, I have to feel, I have to get the business to feel comfortable about it. And I have colleagues in the UK and an APAC that want to feel good about the local lawyer that's going to be working through the, the issues that are unique to those jurisdictions. I want to get them on board with my choice. So it's helpful when the firm at least has, you know, in an FCPA context, just for an example, has, you know, if I hire somebody, uh, you know, at Davis Polk who's got FCPA experience, I, it's nice if there's somebody in the UK at Davis Polk that has UK bribery experience. There is, right? I'll give you his number. All right, good. Mm -hmm. Send me that. <laughs> I already have Greg's information, so just send me the other guy. Um, but you know that—that's th kind of block, basic blocking and tackling these days. I feel like, but you know, predicting whether the ne the matter is going to grow tentacles that reach to South America and Korea, and I, I just don't think that's how we approach it. Just and lastly, I think, as promised, let me turn the same question uh, again to the in-house. Uh, people uh, in terms of the in-house strategy. I think there's <clears throat> been, you know, big institutions like yours for many years have had <clears throat> uh, lawyers, at least transactional lawyers, in all kinds of different, uh, at least financial centers around the globe. And I think we're now beginning to see, or have seen, uh, the addition of uh, litigators in some of these locations, uh, and perhaps in, in some instances, enforcement litigators and local enforcement litigators. Um, how are you seeing that evolution? and, and and do you think that there uh, will be a continuation of that trend line, if you will, in the future? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you from personal experience, we, uh, it wasn't me, it wasn't my decision, it was actually during the interim period when I went back to the government, but J.P. Morgan has, you know, uh, actually brought on uh, legal staff in, in both APAC and EMEA that uh, have litigation experience. Many of them are, you know, UK or uh, lawyers trained in Asia. Some of them are US lawyers that are expats. We have uh, hired folks that used to work for the FCA and are in our UK offices. So I think it's important because the issues, you know, those are the issues we grapple with every day. And it's not, it doesn't even necessarily have to be in an enforcement context. It can be, you know, just an internal review we're conducting where we want to understand what the local regulations require. We, we want some, there's no, also there's, I think there's no substitute for having somebody on our team who's physically present in those jurisdictions that has the relationships with our compliance personnel, our business personnel, can walk down the hall and say, help me understand this trade, help me understand what happened here. Um, I think it makes sense. I think, I mean, I can't say what other banks are doing or other corporations, but um, it certainly makes uh, our efforts uh, more efficient and I think just better overall. Steve, do you Yeah, I, I completely agree. <clears throat> and for me, this ties back to the issue we talked about earlier about whether this is a bubble or not. My own view is that this is the new normal. Uh, and if this is the new normal, then we have to think about our, our traditional staffing model, which for us at least has been to be fairly leanly staffed and to have a heavy reliance on outside counsel. Now there's some kind of work we're never going to bring in-house because we just can't do it. I mean, we're not a law firm, we're a bank. Um, 
but if this is the new normal, then we do need to staff up, and these are the kinds of expertises we need to staff up with. Great, thanks. Um, I, we're virtually out of time, or actually out of time, but I think I'll try to steal a couple more minutes in case there are questions, which I promised I would try to do. Questions from the floor? If not, we're exactly finished on time. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Carrie, Christina, Dave, Tom, and Steve, and we really appreciate it.